So today I built a rather unique PC that I don't recommend any of you build. There are a few reasons why we'll discuss those here shortly. It's an ITX X99 PC. Yes, that is possible. There is a single, as far as I know, X99 ITX motherboard. You may have seen it on Linus's old video. It's from ASRock and it's rather weird looking. You're looking at it right now. I actually painted the motherboard white, the heat sinks, the VRM heat sinks, uh, just because I wanted to match the other components in the system, even though really won't be able to see much of that in the Fractal Node 202 when it's all assembled. The CPU socket alone consumes half of this motherboard's total area. It's definitely a feat. I can grab Congratulate ASRock for being able to pull it off, but I can see why other motherboard manufacturers didn't follow suit. They didn't see the point, and I know ASRock doesn't want to hear this, but it's the truth. There's a reason why you shouldn't build what I'm about to show you, especially in a small form factor case like this. What X99 CPUs bring to the table, those qualities and traits do not line up with what ITX PCs are intended for. Here are two reasons why, and they kind of go hand in hand. The first is that anyone looking to build an ITX PC should already know that a single graphics card, only one, can be used with any modern ITX motherboard because those boards only offer a single X16 slot with which to insert a graphics card. So right there you're limited to one, only, boom. Reason two, and this is uh, this falls into the X99 category, if you're looking to build that kind of PC, chances are you maybe some point down the line want to SLI or Crossfire two graphics cards and if that doesn't apply to you then maybe you just want to overclock the thing and that's super hard to do in a small form factor build like the one you're about to see. So that's my disclaimer up front. This build makes no sense. Please, please, please do not copy this build part for part. You'll see why at the end of this video you'll be slightly disappointed with the results. You could actually build something that is slightly more powerful for a few bucks less. And we'll talk about that at the end as well. With that said, I hope you enjoy this ridiculously nonsensical build.
So a few things I do want to mention. The first is that the cooler you're looking at right now is the cooler that comes with the ITX motherboard from ASRock. And they, they designed the cooler in this way because the socket itself is not a typical 2011 V3 socket. It's not a square socket, it's actually rectangular. And that's because they had to fit so many things onto such a small PCB. So you can tell the RAM uh, slots are right next to the socket and there's a ton of different components to the right of it and above it and behind it. I mean, the socket is huge. Huge. So they had to design a cooler that could fit a, a, a custom, if you will, 2011 V3 socket, and that was actually too tall for the Node 202. It just caused the case to bulge and I couldn't secure it on the corners. So I had to remove that and use a stock Intel cooler from a Haswell CPU. Now this right off the bat is obviously a worst case scenario when it comes to CPU coolers and it's not like this cooler was even designed for the CPU. The CPU has a much higher TDP than what this cooler was thermally designed for. So I didn't overclock the CPU because of that and also something else that's really sketchy, I couldn't mount the, the cooler, right? I mean there's, there's no way to do that because this isn't a square socket. So I had to basically break off the clips on the cooler and then just smush it down as hard as I could. Uh, on top of some thermal paste over the CPU and just kind of hold it there and then run a few burn-in tests Let that kind of you know, let that thermal paste set in and just hold that cooler there It sounds really sketchy and on paper you probably wouldn't think it'd work well But our idle temperatures weren't bad high 20s at idle and then under load with Cinebench R15 low 70s So expect that to be a bit higher under Ida 64 maybe 80s But I'm not gonna be doing any rendering or anything like that on this PC Something else that had me doubting this cooler's ability to cool the CPU is that I had to orient it in such a way that it was not directly on top of the CPU die. It was slightly offset from the heat spreader on top of the CPU and I wasn't sure if that contact was going to be good enough to keep temperatures down under load. But, I mean, as you're seeing right here, our temperatures were actually okay. This is running at stock. This sucks. It's not cool to run an X99 CPU at stock, but it's the best we can do given the components that we have. Now, a consequence of that tying into a price-to-performance ratio is the fact that I could build a Z170 ITX PC in the same case with a 6700K and overclock to probably 4.4 gigahertz and be safe with temps. 4.5, I would say, would be the highest I'd go with something like a CryoRig C7, not with a stock cooler. Temps would be probably in the mid to upper 90s with a stock cooler at a 6700K. You'd have to be at 1.35-ish volts, 4.6 gigahertz. Yeah, I wouldn't try that. 4.4, let's just say 4.4. You're going to get at least the same CB score uh, in Cinebench as the 5820K is at stock with two additional cores and four extra threads. Also consider that you could buy a comparable Z170 ITX motherboard for about 100 bucks less than this board here, which means that you could throw that 100 bucks into something else, something better for that PC or just pocket it. That's my favorite thing to do. Just pocket the money. Nevertheless, moral of the story, do not build this PC. I do hope you enjoyed watching me build it though. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just going to disassemble it after I finish editing this video. I might try VR with it just to see how well it does being that it's a small form factor build. You can just throw it in your living room uh, and use that as like a you know decent PC to play games with on your TV. But it's, it's not practical, not when you could build something on a Z170 or Z270 platform for much cheaper that'll still be just as powerful, if not more powerful, if you need a decent overclock out of it. The 5820K is going to go back on my test bench where it belongs, where all six of its cores and all 12 of its threads will be utilized much more efficiently. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, give it a thumbs down if you feel the complete opposite or if you hate everything about life. Be sure to click the subscribe button if you haven't already and stay tuned for a head-to-head-to-head-to-head -to -head -to -head -to -head comparison between four monolith coolers. I showed them all on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter for more details. This is Salazar Studio. Thanks for learning with us.